Hello and welcome to this joint uh, Freya and uh, open air webinar on the new developments uh, in the field of persistent identifiers. And we have uh, two excellent presenters with us today. Yeah, so our first speaker is uh, Ketil Kop Jakobsen uh, from uh, Pangea and uh, Bremen University in Germany. And uh, he will speak about Freya project and uh, new persistent identifiers developments. Uh, and uh, our second speaker is Dr. Amir Ariani, and um, he's a head of Soda Lab in uh, the Swinburne uh, University of Technology. And he's also on, on the board of directors of uh, Research Graph Foundation. And uh, my name is uh, Irina Kuchma, and um, I work for OpenAir, and uh, I will talk uh, how OpenAir uses persistent identifiers. And uh, Ketil, would you like to start your presentation? And yes. uh, for questions, please use uh, either webinar chat functionality or Q&A functionality, and uh, we'll answer the questions. And it is supposed to be interactive, so please type as many questions as you can. Thank you, and please, Ketil, over to you. Yeah, and let's go. Up here. I'm sorry. I have some issues here. Okay, we're here. Let's try that. Okay, all right, I can do that. That's good. Okay, now I'm shared. Now we're here. Sorry about that. A little technical problems with the uh, toolbar that was in the way of making my presentation to full screen. But, um, but here we are. So um, today, I would very much like to thank you for joining this joint webinar from Freya and Open Air. And my name is Kiesel Coop Jacobs, and I'm from Pangea at Bremen University. Pangea is a data, pub data publisher, and we work with data from many different scientific disciplines. Our primary area is in the natural sciences. Today, I'm going to talk about the project Freya and the new developments that we have uh, done within the area of PID developments. The FRIA project, just a little introduction to what it is that we are doing. Overall, we are concerned with connecting open identifiers for discovery and access and use of research resources. Well, in a nutshell, that actually means that FRIA is all concerned with the use of persistent identifiers. And we, if we take this little um, citation here from our description of work, well, then it explains what it is that we are actually doing, and that is to extend the infrastructure for persistent identifiers as a core component of open research in the EU and globally. And what that means is that FRIA is concerned with uh, facilitating a better infrastructure for persistent identifiers, meaning we are not the guys who are actually producing the pits, but we are the people who are facilitating a better infrastructure to connect existing and emerging PIDs. FRIA is a Horizon 2020 project funded by the European Commission. We build on two preceding projects that some of you may have heard of that also were concerned with uh, persistent identifiers, namely Thor and Odin. FRIA started in December 2017, so we are a little bit more than a year into our work now. And if you would like to see more about what it is that we do, then please take a look at our webpage that you can see here. And also, uh, you can follow us on Twitter. One of the things that really characterizes FRIA is that we work interdisciplinarily. 
and that we draw on expertise from a very diverse group of partners. And as you can see here, we have all our partners listed. We have Datasite, Crossref, Plus, CERN, British Library, STFC, Pangea, Hundawi, Dance, Ants, EMBL. So a very diverse group, including data repositories, publishers, research institutions, PID providers, and libraries. This means that we can actually face the challenges about improving the infrastructure for PIDs from many different angles and representing many different scientific disciplines. One of the things when you hear about FRIA is that you will pretty much always be presented a PID graph. A PID graph is our basic tool that we work around. And here we have a PID graph, a basic one that illustrates how different PIDs that are already existing for the most part is connected. And let me just walk you through the graph. And then afterward, I was, afterwards I will extend it so you can see what we mean by expanding it to include new PID types. Okay, so we have a situation here. If you follow my, my mouse here, you can see that we have author one and author two. They both have an ORCID, that's their PID. Together, they make a publication. That publication goes to the publisher, it's accepted, it's published, it gets a DOI. The publication has now a PID. The author PID, the ORCID, is included in the publication, and the publication DOI is included in the ORCID page of each author. So they're interconnected. The publication is based on a data set. That data set could come from the author, in which case there would be, would be a link between the data set and the author, but it can also come from an open repository, like, for instance, here at Pangea, where I work, where we have uh, data sets from all different kinds of uh, disciplines available. So you can actually search our database, find a data set that suits your purposes, and the data sets that we have available are curated and published and have a PID in form of a DOI. So the data set uh, PID is included in the publication and linked to the author through the publication. Now, in order to analyze this data set that the author found, he or she might have used a software. This could be a software that's available from a repository like Zenodo, for instance. And um, also there, the software uh, can be given a PID. So the software that is used to analyze the data set can be included in the publication and linked to the PIDs of the author. So in this way, we are, uh, Freya is trying to link different PIDs. So what I'll talk to you about, about here, that pretty much already exists. But if we add on, go on to talk about institution, well then it becomes more difficult because there's no clear PID scheme for institutions. If we talk about new PID types like organizations, there are definitely people working on assigning PIDs for organizations. Also within FRIA, some of the, our partners are involved with that. And, and the progress is ongoing, but th there's not a mature PID system for organizations yet either. Then there's a sample, the data set might have been generated from a physical sample that exists somewhere. And that sample has the opportunity of having a, a PID. There are PID systems for samples out there, the IGSN number, for instance, but it, it only covers like uh, a certain part of uh, the physical samples that could be available. I'll get into that later. Then there's instruments. The instruments that were used to analyze the sample to generate the data set that goes into the publication. Now, there is a lot of this debate about PIDs for instruments right now because there's a great need for it. It would be great to have a PID that can identify the instrument that was used to analyze the sample. However, this is not an easy task because where do you start giving a PID to an instrument do you give it to a platform that has several instruments on it? Do you give it to an instrument itself that can be identified as an individual unit? But what if you have an instrument that consists of several sensors? Do you give each sensor a PID? And what if you then recalibrate the sensors after two years? Well, then the whole foundation for the way that the instrument works is different. Do you assign a new PID in that case? or do you leave it as it is? Well, these are challenges that I mentioned here that I know there is a very nice group in RDA that is working on that right now, but 
there's definitely a need for an instrument PID. Other new PIDs also could include data repositories needs a PID, the grants uh, that is funding it, uh, all the, the research. I mean, there are PIDs, but we need a more universal system here. Conferences need a PID. So this is what we in FRIA mean about extend, ex, extending the PID graph to also include new PIDs. But the question is, where do we start? Which P new PIDs are the most important? Which are the easiest ones to take to the next level where they are actually easily implemented? That is some of the questions that we are concerned with in FRIA. So in order to an uh, analyze the landscape of the new PIDs, we did an assessment of the PIDs that are out there and identified the gaps. So which basically means the, the PID systems that we need, but is not there yet, or is there in a still developing form. And the way that we did that was that we uh, explored the need for these PIDs by asking for use cases from the community. And I'm gonna get into what I mean by that in, in just a little bit. But, but all this enabled us to identify the requirements for new potential PIDs. So, so three bullet points on what Freya is doing on uh, the new PID landscape is, first of all, we assessed the current landscape of new PIDs. That is done, there's a report, you can look it up on our webpage. What we're doing right now is we're trying to identify the needs for new PIDs and their requirements. This is, an on, this is something that's almost done, there'll be a re report in a couple of months. And then finally, what we would like to do is to develop prototype for new PID types, but that is a, a um, task that is still in progress. But if we start up with defining the PID landscape, then we did an analysis of the entire PID landscape, looking at what's there, what's existing, what are the PID initiatives, what's emerging, what are people talking about, what do they need, and what is the maturity of all of these PIDs that we could possibly find out there in the research, different research communities from all different scientific disciplines. Well, altogether, we found or identified 25 entities. And by entities, I mean things that could potentially be assigned a PID, like publications, conferences, researchers, organizations, data, and so on and so forth, these entities either have a PID or need a PID. However, this is also not uh, a simple task because there might be a significant overlap among different dif disciplines, and that actually complicates it when we want to determine the maturity. For instance, we can here talk about samples again. Well, samples for geological samples, there is an existing PID system the IGSN number, but if we talk about cultural artifacts, well then there is no good system for PIDs in, in this regard, even though a cultural artifact can actually also be a physical sample. Well then there's something like historical persona. Well this is a persona, it needs an, a PID for persons, but it doesn't really fit the ORCID system. Well if we talk about the remains, of a historical person, well then we can call it a physical sample, but there's also no good PID in this regard. But altogether, for all of these 25 entities, we identified the PID types that are already there and we uh, assigned them a maturity level. And there were actually only three entities, researchers, publications, and data, that have services that are deemed fully mature. The, the, the rest of them are either, re, either emerging, which means that there is a PID system, but it's under development, or they're immature, which means that people are talking about the needs for a PID system, but uh, they're not there yet. You can see a report on this on our webpage. Then we move on and talk about identifying needs and requirements for new PIDs. And this is where the use cases come into the picture because the method that we chose to use for identifying the needs and requirements for new PIDs was we asked the community, the research community concerned with PIDs and PID assignment for use cases. And I'm gonna show you in a little bit what a, use case is, what a use case is in this card. But we got a lot of information here also from conferences where we asked the audience to give us use cases. These use cases enabled us to identify PIDs, new PIDs in high demand 
and identify the requirements for the progress of these new PIDs. So what is a use case in the FRIA context? A use case in FRIA describes a scenario where a PID is needed identifying a user, a goal, and its benefits. And there, it basically follows the template that you can see here on the right-hand side. As a user, could be a researcher, I want a PID for instruments, that is my goal, so that I can track all the publications that comes out of this new instrument. That's a benefit I, as a user, gain from having this new PID. And we collected a lot of use cases in a lot of different areas. Just to give you a, a few of the headlines here, we have cross-linking literature and data via instruments, linking published metadata with instrument metadata, tracking reuse of software and tracing outcome of research cruises. So we have a very diverse collection of use cases. I'm going to give you some examples in just a little bit, but uh, just a little bit about the numbers. So altogether, we collected 72 use cases in total. And from 30 of them, we could identify uh, um, a use case that revolved around what we would call a new PID, emerging or immature. So just to give you an example here uh, about what the use cases were that we collected, and we have one uh, use case that revolves around research cruises. So it says, as a funding agency, I would like to trace the outcome of my financial contribution to a marine research cruise by tracking the data generated and articles, physical samples, and I would also like to track the future data and publications generated from my cruise and the samples it collected. So if you boil this down, then it's a funding agency that would like a research cruise ID so that it can track uh, the future outcome of their investments. We have another use case that revolves around software. It says, as a software author, I want to be able to see the citations of my software aggregated across all versions so that I see a complete picture of reuse. So if we boil this down, the user is a software author. He or she wants a software PID in order to track reuse, which is the benefit for this particular user. We have a use case that revolves around policy, and it's from a research manager that says, as a research manager, I want to have policy IDs so that I can easily identify relevant policies and assess the compatibility between different policies. So here we have, excuse me, a research manager who is the user who wants a policy uh, PID, that's the goal, in order to benefit from being able to assess compatibility between different policies. So from all of these 30 use cases, we uh, made what we call a popularity index. So how many times were different PIDs and need for PIDs mentioned in these use cases? Some use cases um, had more than, most of them actually had more than one PID mentioned. So that's why the total number here adds up to more than 30. But still, what we can see from this was that there is a really big demand for instrument PIDs. There's a lot of talk and a lot of need for uh, development of a, of a PID for instruments. Um, a lot of other um, entities were mentioned in these use cases. So what we're going on in FRIA and anal uh, analyzing further is not only instruments, but also the uh, repositories, organizations, physical samples, grants, and software and we added a few that we have personal interests in from the partners within FRIA, the research campaigns, the data management plans and facilities. So these are the nine PID systems that we are taking on for further analysis. And what we want to do with them is that we want to identify the needs based on the user stories. So why do the users want this particular PID? And we want to validate the current status. I mean, here we can draw on the experience that we have from our landscape analysis, but we want to analyze what it takes to expand this PID type to a level where it can be used more frequently. And this validation 
also includes uh, a cross-disciplinary approach. And here I would like to dwell a little bit on the physical samples again, because I find them really interesting. We had user stories that all labeled physical samples that revolved around information about sediment cores in a repository it, and tracing and relocating misplaced cultural artifacts. And on top of that, identifying samples of bacterial, viral, and fungal strains. And as I told you before, we, ha we have PID systems that are to some extent working in these areas, but they're not fully covering all of them. And so our goal here is to analyze what is out there and what it uh, takes to actually find a system that'll work. Well, maybe not for all of these different kinds of physical samples together, but that in itself will also be a result if we can say, okay, we need a split or we need to try to merge them. Altogether, this should end up uh, in a report that'll be available uh, by the end of February. And we can then try to match the requirements and the needs with the expertise that we have in Fria in order to see how we can move forward in terms of prototyping some of these PIDs. I'm not gonna to go too much into the prototyping now, but just to give you a little bit of an example of how we want to uh, improve the infrastructure for these new and emerging PIDs. I wanna give you a, a use case here from Pangea on how we have implemented uh, the IGSN numbers. So I've set this up as a use case scenario. I'm a geologist, I'm interested in sediment cores. I, it has come to my knowledge through my search of uh, all the literature available that there's something going on in the French Alps. They're taking some very interesting samples there and I want to find out what data is available. So I searched in Pangea and I found out that Banyard et al. 2015, they have published data and that is very interesting and I would actually like to know more about it. So what kind of information do I get from the PIDs that are implemented in the data set in Pangea? So first of all, we have a PID for the authors. So most of uh, the authors here have uh, an ORCID and the ORCID is actionable. So when we click on the ORCID, well then, Here we go. When we click on the ORCID, as you can see here, well then we will be directed directly to the ORCID webpage where we have additional information about the author. In the data set, there is also a PID for the data. Well, this is the one that we're actually looking at and that is what we will use if we need to use the data set and cite it in another publication. On top of that, we have the article uh, PID that will is also actionable and it'll take us directly to the, to the journal webpage where you will find the actual article where this data was published. So these are the mature PIDs that I talked about. What we have added further in, in Pangea and in particular to, to this data set here is we have implemented the IGSN numbers, the numbers for the cores that we're taking in the French Alps to generate this particular data set. These cores are stored in a core repository and have been assigned a PID. And that is now available also in the, um, in the data set from Pangea here. And this means that it's actionable and it'll take you to the IGSN webpage where you can get information about this particular core where these data come from, what kind of material, where it was collected and where it's potentially stored at the moment, so if you wanted to, you could actually trace it down, go get it, get a sample, and do your own analysis. This is a little bit of um, a view of what it is that we would like to expand the new PIDs to also uh, be included in, in this kind of, of information here. To finish up, just out in, in conclusion, our use case oriented method gave a uh, practical orientation about the user's demand for new PIDs. And we could see that in particular, PIDs for instruments, organizations, physical samples, grants, and software were in high demand by the community. Uh, the implementation of some of these new PIDs 
will definitely improve the user's access to additional information. And that is what we're trying to pave the way, uh, the, the way for here in Freya. And with that, that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Kettle. Are there any burning clarification questions to Kettle right now? Because if there are, please type them in the chat or Q&A functionality. If there are no, well, I can see a raised hand, but... Um, let me see if I can allow Peter to speak. I just allowed you to talk if, uh, if you want to ask a question, Peter. Maybe it's easy if you type your question in, in a chat. I think Peter is still mute. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out how to un unmute. Uh, it might be unmute from Peter's side because it says talking per meter. Yeah. As Okay, yeah, Peter is saying that he, does, he doesn't really have a question right now. Uh, shall we continue with Amir? And uh, please think about your questions for Kettle and also for Amir. Okay, so uh, thanks, Irina. Uh, let me start. Uh, okay, so now I think in the second talk, uh, I'm going to um, go a bit across a couple of different, uh, if you like, more philosophical perspective around the PEAT and connecting with scholarly works. Uh, and I think if it would be in a way complementary to what uh, Ketum uh, said about the, creating the PEAT graph, but I'm going to basically look at the PEAT graph more as a user or as the infrastructure that used the PEAT infrastructure rather than a PEAT provider. So uh, uh, while I have been fortunate enough to work with the PID um, infrastructure system is almost about six years. And all of this uh, time, we actually use this platform for a big bulk of connecting its scholarly works. So in this presentation, what I'm going to do, I thought in the short time that we have, I can talk about a bit of background that where and how the working group in the Research Data Alliance got to the point to leverage the PID infrastructure. I will talk about a kind of uh, living age technology that right now in this space using the PID and PID graph underneath. And also I have a couple of points about the PID graph. So that's the, that would be almost aligned with the same things that Kettle mentioned. And also the other thing is that uh, this slide set is almost uh, um, abstract version of a one hour talk. So there is a lot of things here that I'm going to actually jump over the topics. I'm going to mention them, but it wouldn't, we wouldn't have enough time to actually looking at the details. If there is a need for further discussion, we can always have an offline conversation about any of the uh, quote unquote jargons that I'm going to mention as part of the presentation. Now, uh, well, on the background side, in, back in uh, about six years ago, or, uh, we had a problem in which is still a lot of repositories still have that problem. And that is finding the related data sets. If you are running a data infrastructure, if you are a researcher who is searching in a data infrastructure for a data set, or if you just randomly come across a paper that cited a data set, when you're looking at that data set, you think, okay, what are the other data sets on the internet that are linked to this? Now, in the concept of paper, we have the paper citation and our uh, discovery tools. And this is, you have a Microsoft Academic Graph and Google Scholars and lots of different services that provide you with overall context around the publications and the scholarly works in that space. But when it gets to the data, our options are very limited. 
Google recently launched a data search platform, um, but still that wouldn't directly address the problem of looking at individual data set and find the related work to this. Now, uh, this was the issue for a group of data infrastructures and uh, lots of people in this space. Uh, in very early days in 2013, this led to creation of the working group that called data description registry interoperability. The idea was finding a better ways for connecting research data across multiple infrastructure points. And one of the earlier partners in this project was Dryad, CERN, and ANT. <clears throat> and I'm going to use some of that data to show you the sort of works that we did in the beginning to actually find some way to actually address this problem. Now, this is a, a screenshot from the Research Data Australia. That's a service that hosted by uh, Australian National Data Service in Australia. And we are looking at one page here, which is a description of a data set. It, you, on the right side, you can see some similar data sets linked to this, but assume that that thing is not there. If you only have the information in the middle, you probably, if you search for information related to this, you have multiple different options. In the old days, we actually used to grab a title or related keyboards and search in the data site, REST services, or other related things to find related data sets. Now, the working group at a time thought, okay, well, we can do better. Let's do a different method. Let's actually, uh, looking at the name of the author, we can Google the name of the author. We will find a page of the researcher, which is a uh, Professor Catherine Bilov in the University of Sydney. We can go to that page, we can go look at all the articles, we can read the individual articles, and in one of those, we will find a link to a data set in a Dryad repository, which is actually, in this case, has a persistent identifier. We go to that repository, and we find another data set by the same author, which in this case actually has a different name or different abbreviation of that name. It's called Belof K. So what happened here is actually we went from a data set to a researcher, from a researcher to a publication, and from a publication to another data set. We technically connected two different data sets by presenting the concept that they might be related. We don't know if they are directly related, but they're conceptually related. They are produced either by the same author or they are the reference in the same publication. So there are some links in that space that connect this information together. That was the point of the DDRI working group and the work that we did was around developing this model to find this, uh, or make it production level service. So the repository can use this for connecting the data sets in their own infrastructure. Uh, the work was led to creating a piece of software system that called Research Data Switchboard, and it was basically automating the same process that I explained. It was using the Google API uh, to link the information across internet. And one of the things it was doing that, that was important, it was resolving all the identifiers. And it was building a model that later on got the name of the research graph. Now, the the core of this activity comes back to connecting uh, different scholarly works and scholarly assets using technically two or three degrees of separation. So examples here on the screen there are two degrees of separation. We have two data sets that are cited by the same paper. We have two data sets that are funded by the same grant. And we have two data sets that are created by the same researcher. And the difference between this and the concept of data citation is that we don't know any causality in this. There is no direct relationship between these two data sets. We just have some evidence that they might be related. Uh, the formation of this work underneath with some other studies that, as I said, we don't have enough time to go through this, so this is actually quite a strong evidence to find related information across the web. We published a paper in the scientific data with a cluster of our records that was curated for the purpose of public use. Um, and in that nature article, one of the things that we found was in our curated data set, 70% of our publications had DOI and 46% of our data sets had DOI. Now, 
oh, the significance of this is that when we were curating this graph, if you like, for the nature, we were trying to find the clusters that are highly connected, so rather than have lots of scattered information, it was more focused on finding interconnected information. And that was an interesting observation. Again, this was a quite a small case study with a very limited information. And the most of the DOI that we get obviously here from the data site and Crossref, but it doesn't mean that this, is, this information can be applied generally. So just please don't take this one as an overall a statistic across the internet. <clears throat> now, uh, so this is what we did at a time uh, around the um, kind of connecting repositories, but later on, we start developing something that called Augment API. And the Augment API is similar concept, but it's actually very much driving the information from persistent identifier because of the trust that we had in the relationships of those identifiers and because of the availability of the services that enables building relationships on the fly. I'll give you an example of this. So this is a data set from the NCI, which is a data infrastructure facilities in Australia. They have a data set that called Blue Link. And this is a, one of their major collections in their uh, data repository. Now, if we use the online API of just the PID providers, we can actually traverse graph and build information and as, I'm, as I'm going to show you. Uh, the, the researcher who worked on that data set uh, from the MCI data, uh, we know that is Peter Oak. We know Peter Oak has an ORCID ID. So we can actually go from the researcher in NCI to the ORCID record. Once we, uh, so this is our kind of first level connection. Once we are in the ORCID record, we get all the publications. Uh, once we have those publications, you can look for the data sets that are cited in those articles. And it, it, I might just oversimplify this in a more comprehensive version. Uh, I, there was a bit of technology involved to actually finding these relationships between the data sets and papers. But let's assume for uh, example sake that this just magically happens. And then you actually have the data set. Then there are other data sources like Scolix, which is another initiative by Research Data Alliance that give you a link between the data sets and publications. So you start to building this graph. And the beauty of that is that you can build this graph dynamically because there are REST, REST trusted API for every single of these P providers to find the related information. Now, what does it mean for NCI? Well, for NCI, we can actually transform their geo-network repository uh, to a graph database. Then we can send this one to the research graph infrastructure. We can augment this with the uh, information come from research graph. And then it gives you a bigger graph. And lots of blue points, which are all blue as a color coding of research graph, blue is the publication, and orange are the data sets, and green are researchers. So the, most of the blue information and green ones come from the research graph augmentation API. And this, they kind of fill the gap. The process, as I said, is kind of in this presentation is oversimplified. It doesn't just blow out the graph with n degrees of uh, graph claw, uh, crawling. It actually just fills the gap. It uses the shortest path algorithm. But regardless, this is the difference between before and after the service. So this is the NCI graph before the augmentation on the left. All the orange ones are the data sets. And using this augment API and the power of these persistent identifier services, we complete the graph on the right. So we give them a better picture. And this was completely, it was possible using the PID identifiers and also a piece of PID services. In, in that space. And because for every single of this, this graph would be different tomorrow compared to today as these publications and data sets and graphs are evolving. Now, with all of these technologies, what did we learn? Well, uh, the first thing that uh, was quite apparent to us was uh, the kind of the persistent identifiers in a way saves money for a lot of infrastructures. 
Uh, prior, so this whole journey that I mentioned in the last like 10 minutes is actually like five years worth of investigation in different technologies. And we found there are so many ways that you can run complicated disambiguation algorithm to disambiguate authors, disambiguate uh, titles of publications and so forth. Um, and all of those processes are actually very expensive if you do that live. But when you use the pits, it actually are encapsulated into your ecosystem. It's much, much easier to implement. And for repositories and for universities and for research groups, it's actually affordable to build a, add, added value services top of this PID infrastructure. The second thing is that not all connections have the same value. So during this time, we tested so many different methods. We use a graph clustering methods, we, need, we use topic modeling and different data mining techniques. We found, yes, with different level of accuracy, we can guess if these two papers are the same, if these two authors are the same, but just that one example that you go to the conference and present something and Joe Blog is not the same Joe Blog as you thought he is, that's just one false positive. It's, uh, it just put a big, um, a dent into the accuracy of the data. We're using the PEATS provided with the trusted connections because the provenance of the data is quite clear. So we know actually where that information comes from. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, the, using the, even if there is a mistake in the problem, well, in the PEAT metadata records, uh, still you know where is the source. So it's more kind of like fixable. So you can go there, fix it, and then that would propagate to the system. The second lesson that we learned is that in the beginning, uh, when we were doing this about six years ago, uh, it was quite tempting to just create a big graph. We just started from literally from 500 nodes to 5,000 nodes to the 5 million nodes to the 50 million nodes. As today, there are about 250 million records of a scholarly uh, communication records. And what we found very quickly is that Collecting all of these the information, they're not, they're not dynamic data. As we collect them, they are actually expires because the information is changing in that space. So it's kind of like you want to navigate into this. If you want to build a service that really add value, like what Kettle mentioned uh, about different use cases, that's not about just creating a big graph. It's actually about finding and creating the fast, trusted, and sustainable services that enables innovation and other people can actually build um, discovery methods that traverse this graph, traverse this big uh, ocean of data that we have and actually find the right answer for our users. Lesson three, which is uh, the most important one, we need, we need to actually more invest in the business of connecting rather than collecting. So uh, when, as I said, when we started about six years ago, it was quite exciting to create a big graph. Uh, and I have seen a lot of copies of these big graphs. So there, it's getting quite fashionable to have another curated version of this. And we have this in different shapes and forms. There are startup companies rising into this. We have different projects. But the, the problem statement is not to create a very large uh, cohort of scholarly connections. That cohort is already exists. That's the, that's the network of scholarly communication that's already available across the web. The question is, well, how do we connect this information? So connecting here is the number one priority and at least the most valuable use case for uh, any uh, new service or any new uh, platform that wants to leverage this ocean of data. Now about the PEAT graph, uh, so given everything that I mentioned, the Research Graph Foundation has a quite a strong interest in the success of PEAT infrastructures and in the development of PEAT infrastructures. And really the PEAT graph, which is a graph of identifiers underneath, is one of the key enablers for everything that we do. Uh, in that space, uh, uh, where there's lots of collaboration between our work and FRIA, and um, based on that collaboration, I added a couple of slides. I think it, these are kind of just repeating what uh, Kethel mentioned, uh, but I'm just repeating my understanding from where the flyer goes with this. That might also open the conversation in this space. That the aim of the PEAT graph is providing a list of federated restful 
uh, JSON API. And these actually, the aim is one is that they have to be disciplinary applications, um, uh, kind of ready services. So we can actually implement these services into different repositories or platforms or infrastructures. They need to be able to support the uh, European Open Science Cloud applications. And also it needs to be able to provide um, enough uh, level of dependencies in the, uh, in the JSON API that actually enables some level of graph visualization for the end user. Uh, now, this is again another version of the use cases, uh, just this is more in the language of research graph, if you like. So there's a couple of examples. One of them is that if you have a data set across multiple different infrastructures, with multiple different versions, that actually happens a lot. In a lot of fields, the data actually has multiple versions stored in different places. Uh, we want to collect the citation for all of them, so we should be able to report all of them at once. If I have a data set and I put that data set, for example, in Fixture and for simplicity, let's say there's only one place for it, but we have updated this data set 10 times and there are different citations for different version of this, uh, given that each version has different DOI, we want to be able to accumulate all of those citations into one uh, metric. Uh, something similar about funding, if you have a grant and that grant actually mentioned in a data set and a publication, and uh, some other activities uh, like research projects. And as we just learned that FI is working on creating a kit for the projects and grants, then uh, we want to actually have this um, kind of list of connections. So we have a grant, that grant actually um, funded some other smaller grants or projects produce some papers and some data sets. So it should be one place for a new service or app to go and search for all of this information rather than actually hitting 50 different APIs and try to reconsolidate the data. And the last one, I actually don't have any mathematical model for this because it's kind of, uh, it's one of those things that uh, you don't know the answer until you start working on it. And what would be the most effective linking method between data and publications? And uh, that's, what it is, it's, this is a text from one of our user stories uh, that um, careful mentioned. Um, as a researcher, I want an easy way to more effectively link all the data to, pu to publication. And as a reader, I want to be able to easily find all the data related to a publication. Now, uh, we are, well, there is a repository of this on GitHub that you can go and uh, see all the prior uh, work around these user stories. Uh, some of this it might lead to answer the questions of what API we want at the end uh, and potential users. And the other thing that uh, I think just uh, listening to both Ketel's presentation and also my understanding from a work like this is finding the model for prioritizing the work on which API needs to be built first. Okay, so uh, what next from here? There is a buff. Uh, that um, is planned for RDA Plenary 13 in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, so the proposal is up there, but we don't know the date and um, uh, the, uh, the conference program. So that would be a good place to follow up this conversation. If you need more information about the project FIRE, that's website, uh, that's website for research graph, and uh, that's my contact information. And I'm, I'm, I hope this didn't lead to so many open-ended questions, but feel free to send me an email. Thanks a lot, Amir. Are there any burning questions to Amir right now? We don't see any, so perhaps let, let, let me show you open air use case uh, of uh, pizza. And uh, then we can have a Q&A session. Second. I'm opening my slides. Hope you can see them well. Uh, 
open air uh, is a uh, European Commission uh, funded project uh, facilitating open science in Europe. Uh, our current phase uh, open air advance has been uh, uh, launched uh, around more or less same time as Freya. And um, what we do, we collect uh, metadata about uh, publications, uh, data sets, uh, software, and other research outputs uh, from um, repositories of publications, uh, from open access journals, from data repositories, uh, software repositories, CRIS systems, and other aggregators. Uh, we do some uh, validation, cleaning, the duplication, um, inferring, linking, and uh, then we um, present connections between uh, project sources, uh, data sets, uh, and uh, other research outputs. Uh, and uh, we have uh, different services on top of uh, our portal. Uh, so one of them is uh, Squalix uh, that was already mentioned there. Uh, and uh, we hope that this aggregated um, information is useful for measuring um, impact of research uh, and some research trends. Uh, obviously, we collect different types of publications from different repositories. So for example, from uh, institutional uh, repositories, we collect uh, information about uh, publications, articles, preprints, reports, but also in some cases uh, data sets. Then uh, from uh, data repositories, uh, we collect data sets uh, from uh, uh, journals and publishers. Uh, we also collect information about publications. Uh, and uh, we are looking um, into software and other research products uh, in open air advance uh, to see how we can better link them to project publications. So, uh, we have um, a content aggregation policy and uh, based on the uh, content acquisition policy, we build uh, open air information graph. And uh, this is what uh, our content acquisition policy says, uh, that uh, open air accepts uh, the metadata records of all scientific products whose structure respects the model and semantics as expressed by the open air guidelines. And this means that both open access and non-open access material will be included and links to other products will be resolved where this is possible. And this is where we actually use PIDs because uh, um, uh, for us, PIDs are resolvers of those links. Uh, this slide shows the role of PIDs in open air. So it helps to identify and register content providers, it helps to identify researches, it helps in metadata data application, uh, enrichment uh, and notification because we have uh, a service where repository managers could be notified uh, uh, if uh, a richer metadata is available to be added to their repositories. And then we also use PIDs for resource linkings, uh, linking and also for resource metrics and for tracking aggregated usage statistics. Uh, we have uh, guidelines for data providers. So originally we started with uh, guidelines for compatible uh, repositories with publications. Then we had guidelines for data repositories uh, and for grid systems. Uh, and we're also working on guidelines for software repositories. Uh, so we sort of started from uh, looking into publications uh, and we're expanding into open science areas. Uh, and uh, our guidelines uh, help to improve interoperability of metadata information exchange. 
We also hope that they support fair data principle. And uh, of course, we reuse existing standards. Uh, and uh, this is where we extend vocabularies when necessary, for example, for different P types. And um, these are some, some of the examples of PEDs that OpenAI uses for different entities. So for example, uh, this is what we use for the resource identifier. So we extend data sites list of PED identifiers types. Uh, we also have um, PEDs for alternative identifiers of the resource. Uh, and uh, you can see them uh, listed here on this slide. Uh, and we have PEDs for related identifiers to the resource. Uh, these identifiers that are related to the registered resource. And they are listed on this slide. And then, of course, we have PEDs for authors and contributors. And um, they are kind of standards, uh, standard ones. Uh, and uh, PEDs for funders and uh, project grants, uh, cross ref funder, ISNI, and GREED. And uh, this is an example of uh, information displayed uh, on the open air search portal. So you can see uh, a data set uh, and um, it's linked to um, a data set deposited in uh, Dan's data repository. And uh, it's also linked to an article where this data set was used. Uh, some issues and next steps, uh, and that's where OpenAir is working with, uh, in uh, relevant uh, RDA working groups and also collaborating with Freya Project. Uh, of course, we want to improve the discovery and integration of uh, community-specific identifiers and metadata. And uh, we also want to improve the integration of DOI version in uh, supported by the Nodder, which is uh, a repository that uh, OpenAI and CERN manage. So that was uh, a quick introduction. And I'll stop sharing my screen. And that's time uh, for your questions to Ketil, Amir, or Eliana, and uh, Ellen from Dance, uh, who are here with us from uh, Freya and Open Air Project as well. So here yeah, I stopped screen sharing. Any questions? I don't see any coming up. It either means that uh, we've been all very clear, or I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so th there is a question, uh, how can we follow uh, your pro progress in the future? I can um, answer that for, for Friar at least. Um, we have our web page. So there all the reports that we are producing uh, are available. We have a list of activities also. If you want the direct day-to-day, -day, or not day-to-day, -day, but week-to-week -week interaction with us, then Twitter is, uh, is a good opportunity to connect with Friar where you will get tweets about our upcoming activities, where we will be presented, who you can meet, and uh, information like that. Okay, and I can, <clears throat> about the research graph, um, I would probably say the best person, sorry, the best place always to meet everyone and get involved is the Research Data Alliance, apart from this, uh, also the webinars and the website and all the other contact points. Um, well, yeah, as I said, that usually, the, every RDA, we either have something new or something interesting happening. So that's probably the best place to get together. 
Also, I just noticed we have a couple of other questions on the uh, Q&A board. So there is one question for me is about saying something about the links between PEDS. Um, so that's from uh, Elian. I don't know exactly uh, what you're asking. Uh, I, I can't say about, uh, I don't know if it's about this, you're asking about the statistics that how many PEDS are connected or uh, if the PEDS are actually, or we are, or we are using the connections. Um, oh, okay, yes, uh, around the citation and fund, uh, funding. So there is one thing is, so there are two things. One is uh, when it gets to PEDS, uh, we use PEDS in two different contexts. One is that there is a metadata, there is a relationship in the metadata of the PEED. Data site, for example, has a very good uh, corpus of these kind of connections and APIs on data space is very good. Uh, ORCID also is the same, uh, in the same category. And cross has started to explore the concept of the event data, which provides something similar. So the, the data provider tells you that these two uh, PEEDs are linked. So that's one scenario. The second scenario is that, and that's where you get things like the cited by and funded by and so forth. And there is the, another scenario is where there is a repository or a university research management system or a library system that in data space, a librarian said, this DOI is linked to this ORCID. So in this case, you have an or another authority source that actually linked these two different kits together. So of course, in this scenario, the, uh, the accuracy or the type of provenance is different around the links, but it still is much better, well, it's more trusted connection than something that just drives by AI and machine uh, learning. So is, there are two different types of connections from Pete. I don't know exactly if that was the question, but I'll try my best. There was also a question from Bilana. Um, could you explain a little bit more about current status of uh, PID4 organization? I think probably Kefal is the best person to answer that. And I'm sorry, I'm, I must pass on that one too. I, um, th this is not uh, the area that I spe specialize in, so I'm, I'm not going to say anything that uh, I, I don't know exactly about. So I'll pass on that one, but um, contact me and I can put you in contact with the right people. And then there is a question from Quentin. Is there someone specifically to discuss historical persona? Uh, yes, within Friar, that is something that we have, uh, that we have discussed and, and we have uh, ongoing discussions. So I also suggest here that you to contact me and uh, then I'll, I'll put you in contact with the people who are concerned with, uh, with personal persona. This is, I must say, a very interesting um, entity in terms of assigning PIDs. And I think it's, it's challenging, difficult, but, but definitely needed and interesting. And the rest two questions from uh, Muriel. Uh, is anyone working with Wikidata who also have lots of PIDs for people, artifacts, locations, etc., useful and relevant to research and researchers, sir? So I know that uh, OpenAir collaborates uh, a bit with Wikidata, but unfortunately also, I... Uh, yes, I, I can also comment on that. We just started exploring some of that information. So that's one of the items, uh, one of the kind of engagements that Research Graph explores. And for Freya, it, it's on the radar, but it's, uh, I, I am not familiar with the current status of our involvement. And then also Muriel asked, anything ambassadors can do for you to help you share progress knowledge? Uh, I, think, I think Elaine might be uh, the right one to answer that if she would unmute. Yes, hello everybody. This is uh, Elian. Um, I'm from the communication team of Freya and it was also co-organizing this webinar today. Um, yes, uh, we are definitely looking for new ambassadors. We have an ambassador program. If you go on our website, you can find all information there. Uh, we do involve our ambassadors in webinars um, regularly, so we are happy to get information from you. So 
if you are not an ambassador yet, please go on the website and have a look. Thank you. Uh, then there was a question, would you recommend implementing uh, this new PIDs uh, in an institutional repository now or in the near future? Or what is the time frame until we could use this new PIDs actively? Yeah, that, that, that is a very broad and a very good question. And of course, it's, um, it's individual for, for each of the PIDs. So it, but if you want to have an idea about the time frame, I, I suggest that you, you tune in to the report that's coming out of our analysis of these nine pits that I presented earlier today. And, and there you'll get an idea about the current status of the development of these uh, emerging and for, in some cases also a bit immature PIDs. And it'll get you a, an idea about when something could potentially come out. Of it. But I mean, it's hard to say because it's not like there's a deadline three years down the line and we can say, well, for instrument pits, in three years, everything is up and running. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a development in progress and that's always how it is, but we're definitely talking uh, years in, in this case here. But, I mean, in Freya, as, uh, we, we can work on different levels. So you heard Amir here from a technical point of view, there are some universal technological developments that, can, that is in progress and will help um, implement the PID services in, on a larger scale. And then you saw the presentation that I did uh, just from the little uh, last scenario from Pangea where we implemented ideas ends. So you can say the implementation can go on and at different levels, but of course what we want to see is uh, something that's happening more generally that can be um, taken up and used by the larger community, especially in terms of technological development. And I can comment about uh, PIDs for instruments. Uh, there is, uh, I don't remember, is there a working group or an interest group um, in RDA on this topic? Uh, so perhaps if you're interested in instruments, that's a place uh, for you to, to check and maybe join some communi uh, community discussions. Um, Muriel said that he's already an ambassador and uh, is there anything he could do apart from sharing uh, knowledge uh, with uh, his teams and colleagues? Uh, maybe Frey is interested in more user studies uh, at Sydney or similar? Sheep, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know. Can you take this one, please? Yeah. You are muted. Just is this a question for uh, University of Sydney? I can just add something here. Uh, Mural, I just remember that the University of Sydney has been one of the participants in the DDRI working group way back about 2014, 2015. Uh, there is some ongoing work in the research office in this space. Uh, I don't know about the exact user stories or use cases, how it can work, but there are some connections there to explore and there are some possibility, uh, some capability in place to actually connect library systems to uh, this kind of graph modeling technology at the University of Sydney. And, and I would say in, in regard to the user stories, then, I mean, we are definitely interested in hearing about good user stories who can illustrate what exactly it is that, that we are doing in connecting and paving the way for new PID services. So let, let us know if you have interesting user stories that we can put on our agenda and that we can move forward. I think that would be also very useful for Freya. Thank you. And I think uh, we answered all the questions received so far. Uh, thanks a lot for 
joining this webinar and apologies that we went a bit over time, uh, but I think it was worth it. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Katia, Lamir, Eliane, Ellen, uh, for organizing this webinar. Uh, like I said, uh, presentations are already on the webinar page. Uh, we would also make uh, recording available um, uh, on the webinar page, and we will also upload it to open a YouTube channel. Um, thank you all, and uh, have a good rest of the day, and uh, a good weekend, and happy 2019. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you very much.